Hallelujah. Somebody say amen again. Well done, guys. What a blessing. Good song. What a beautiful name it is. Amen. And what is that name? I couldn't hear that. What is it? Hallelujah. The name that causes demons to tremble. Hallelujah. No other name like it in all of heaven. We've been in our series of messages entitled uh, Ministry Matters. Last week we talked about who do you think you are? This week is who do you think we are? And it's important as we've gone through this series, we've talked about obviously number one of the series about who we are in Christ as ministers. We all are. And that we all have a ministry and we need to discover that, that ministry. In chapter two, we really delved in, in part two, uh, a little bit more of that ministry and the calling and our relationship and our identity. And we've talked about that to some degree about who we, who we are as individuals. Who am I? Who do I think I am? And I need to know who I am because who I am, if I really understand who I am, it changes everything about what I do. It changes about how I act, how I talk, how I respond. If I were what I used to be, I'm a mess. But I'm not that guy anymore. I'm a new person to Christ. And in that, we talked about our identification as a royal priesthood and what that means, our ministry before the Lord, our ministry of service before the Lord. We talked about our relationship to, uh, to carrying out the, the things that the Lord has to carry out. But I want to move to another aspect of this ministry and the ministry matters that we're talking about is who do we think we are. If all I am concerned about is who I am in Christ and I just have myself a little hallelujah party because I'm a priest and I'm a king and I'm the, you know, the, the, the son of the king and all the things that we talked about, I'm a pilgrim in this life, I'm, a, I'm an alien passing through, I'm a sojourner, I'm an ambassador for Christ, I'm a royal nation, a holy people. If, that's, if, if I just park there, I become a spiritual narcissist. You know, It's just about me. And that's where a lot of Christians are. God is for their benefit, and that stops right there. What can you do for me, God? How can you help me, God? You know, what can I get from you, God? What promise can I claim so that I can have something more from you, God? But that's not where it stops, amen? It goes out, once we begin to understand who we really are, uh, then it begins this whole new world of accountability and this whole new world of responsibility. And what is wrong so much in the church in America today is we just hadn't got to this, this, this sermon yet, Amen? in general in the churches today about responsibilities to each other and to the body of Christ. And if we, we don't get that, we're just going to be troubled all along. It's like the guy who went to the doctor and he, and he gets into the doctor's office. He has this acute state of anxiety. He's just freaking out. And he said, doctor, uh, you got to help me, man. I think I'm dying. I said, why do you think you're dying? Whenever I touch, it hurts. If I touch my head, it hurts. If I touch my arm, it hurts. If I touch my stomach, it hurts. If I touch my leg, my... where about that? It just hurts. I mean, I can't touch anything without it hurting. Chest hurts. And the doctor said, just hold on. Let me examine you. Took him through a complete examination. At the end of the examination, he said, well, uh, sir, I have some good news for you. And I got some bad news for you. The good news, you're not dying. Bad news, you broke your finger. Now, as silly as that story is, it is certainly an accurate picture of churches today. We have broken parts, and everything is hurting as a result of it. And I see churches, even our own church, can go through like cycles of this, where we begin to lose the context of who do you think you are around us, and who are these people around us. And we have to realize that when you, start, when you begin the study of Scripture, and you start seeing what the Bible has to say, uh, this this. This issue of a human body and even the spiritual body are very similar. Just as a human body, you know, with its tissues and muscles and ligaments and bones and organs and all that are designed to work together, you know, uh, the body of Christ is composed of a lot of different members who are responsible to each other, who need each other. Let me put it this way. If I were to take my lungs out this morning and set them on the pulpit here, they're not going to work. I'm not going to work. They can't survive without me. I can't survive without them. I can't take my heart out and say, I don't need it. I need it. So is the body of Christ. Now, this is something we know intellectually, but what we have to do is to know it experientially. That we desperately, whether we understand it or not, need each other just as much as the human body is composed of all these elements that are designed to work in, in harmony together, then the church body, if it is going to properly function and be the church that it's called to be, it has been designed by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God 
to, to work and function together. And as it does that, it becomes a witness to the world around it, you know, that there's a unique fellowship and a unique group of people that are not like anything the rest of the world has to offer. And what that results in here is, is that each person in our church has an understanding that we need each other and we're ministering to one another. Now we know when we got saved, hopefully we do, that when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, we all became one in Christ. And in reality, we're all singularly one in our position in Jesus Christ, all right? That's who we are. The Holy Spirit placed you and placed me into the body of Christ at the moment I was saved. The Bible says I was baptized into the body of Christ. I became one with him. The same spirit that dwells in you dwells in the person sitting beside you, behind you, in front of you, if they're, if they're believers and if you're a believer. Amen. Amen. The same spirit, the same Jesus that saved you was the same Jesus that saved them. And the same father who is their heavenly father is also your heavenly father. Therefore, you are united in a very unique and special way. Now, this is what's happened in position. But it is not necessarily true in the church today that it operates that way in practice, that it actually is carried out the way God wants it to. Jesus prayed many times. Some of the prayers are written out. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see that prayer. Not my will, but thy will. But the prayers before Gethsemane, Jesus is praying in John chapter 17. And his prayer was in John 17, Lord, that they may all be one as we are one. Now, he was praying for his disciples. And if you read the context of that, he's praying for every person who would ever come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we, it's Jesus' desire, the Father's desire, that we understand that and live practically, not just positionally, but practically in that same kind of relationship and that same kind of fellowship. Our service to one another, what we do in ministry to one another, is why God gifts us, why he places in the body, why we become one in Christ. There's no person in this body, no matter what their talents and gifts might be, that are less needed or more needed than the other persons. Each of you, are vital to the success of Believer's Fellowship if we are really going to do, really going to be what God has called us to be. Far too often, especially in this age that we live in, people have a tendency to isolate themselves and to cut themselves off. And church, they come into it, they sit down, they praise, they worship, they listen, they take notes, they read the Bible, and then they go home. But there's no interrelationship and no interacting. You know, when we sat down in the very beginning days and started the, 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 the work on the promise that God had put in our hearts about a church, one of the things that came up was, what are we going to call this church? What are we going to name this thing? A lot of names were written down. People were putting in names. But we kept coming back to one synonymous idea, fellowship. And end up calling it what? Believers? The New Testament word in the scripture describing us as the family of God is this particular word, fellowship. It's the Greek word koinonia. And it means communion or intimate communication. What God has designed and desired, not just for me or just one or two of you, but for all of us, is for us to live in this koinonia fellowship. Even in Genesis chapter 2, when God is addressing this whole issue about mankind and humanity, he's created Adam and he says, now it is not good for man to be alone. He creates out of Adam's rib a spouse, and out of that he creates the whole human family built on the mindset of relationship and fellowship. It is not good for Adam to be alone, and it's not good for any Christian in believer's fellowship to live a life alone, to live apart, to isolate yourself. We're all called to be the part of this body of Christ, which is the epitome of what real koinonia fellowship. God never intended in Scripture for this to be about a building where people attend and walk in lonely and walk out still lonely. He intended for you to come to be a part of a group, 
a part of a body and to interact and to fellowship in that body so that we realize that where we come to, although it is a building, it is the place of fellowship, the place of community, the place of common oneness together in Christ Jesus. There's a guy by the name of Bruce Larson who's written lots of books. But in one of his books, he's got, he's got it titled, Dare to Live Now. Great title, isn't it? But he gets into the book and he, and he addresses what I'm talking about here. And he uses the illustration of the neighborhood bar. He says this, the neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit there is to fellowship that Christ wants to give his church. Now, I said counterfeit, all right? That means it's an imposter. He says, it's an imitation. Instead of dispensing liquor, instead of dispensing liquor instead of grace, dispensing escape rather than reality, but it is a permissive, accepting, inclusive fellowship. It's unshockable, democratic. He went on to say, you can tell people secrets at the bar and they usually don't tell others or even want to. He goes on. The bar flourishes, not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put into the human heart the desire to know and to be known, to love and to be loved. So many seek a counterfeit at the price of a few beers. Now, the genius of the church is that it meets this deep desire of humanity for belonging and for relationship and for fellowship. But listen to me carefully. It is not simply met by attending a Sunday morning service, by just coming into an assembly, large or small, and seeking to remain anonymous. It's just not going to work that way. There is a desperate need in every person for personal, intimate fellowship and that really can only fully and truly exist in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because why? We've been equipped for that kind of place. We've been equipped for that kind of fellowship. God has given to us not only a new nature, he's given to us a common family in Christ. He's also given us his Holy Spirit. And then listen to this, every one of us, whether we realize them or not, have been given a spiritual gift to enhance the whole fellowship, not for me. The gifts are not for me. The gifts are for you that God gives to me. In other words, it's a body life. And I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about fellowship. And we talk about believers fellowship. This is what we're talking about. And if you haven't locked into this, and I would say there's some folks here, more than a few who probably, you know, they, they still don't get this aspect of it. You know, they, they still haven't embraced this. And I'll talk about fellowship. I'm going to deal with just four things this morning. One, we'll talk about the basis of fellowship, the nature of fellowship, what endangers our fellowship, and what are the responsibilities of fellowship. The basis of fellowship is first, all right? There's, there, there's much phony fellowship today because, you know, people get together for all kinds of things. But the Lord is looking for this koinonia, which, shares, which is talking about a sharing, a, a communion, a, a, a common ground. That we have a, we have a, we have a partnership in something that is very rare. There's a lot of partnerships out there in the world. There's a lot of groups out there today. You know, on Sunday morning, usually around the springtime, it gets most frustrating for me uh, when I'm coming from the other campus over to here because I come down some back roads, you know, Harden Store and all those little back roads that come out on 2978 and stuff instead of going the longer route. And it's usually pretty good until you get to this time of year in the spring, there's a little fellowship that's always blocking the road. They're bicyclers. You know, they got all the nice equipment on. They got the cute little helmets, you know, and the little spandex pants, you know, and little spandex shirts and all their little colors. They're so, they're so fashionable, you know. But they're always in my way. <laughs> and they're not content to ride by themselves. They want to ride in groups of 20, 30, 40 sometimes down there. And that's the dumbest road in the world to ride bikes on. I don't know, you know they don't listen to me. You know, so you need to pray for your pastor, especially during the springtime when the bikers are doing that back road thing. Because you got away, you don't want to scare them passing them, you know, but you got to get around them because you're not going to drive 20 miles an hour all the way over here on a road that's 35, 40 miles an hour, right? So, you, but they have a little club and they all bicycle together and they all wear similar little common uniforms. And, you know, they, they, 
They get all dressed up and they're excited about it. And, you know, we got clubs like that. We got Kiwanas and Lions clubs and Rotary clubs and, you know, golf clubs and motorcycle clubs. And everywhere you look, humans are trying to lock into some identity and some relationship and some fellowship. But that never really fully satisfies, especially if you can't ride a bicycle. <laughs> so, but the church, on the other hand, God does this supernatural works in our life and he puts us a part of this beautiful fellowship. Listen to what the Apostle John says. He really zeroes in and says, what we have seen and what we have heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship. Well, that's with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What's he saying here? He's saying, well, this gospel message is to be personally experienced. It should be lived out in a very practical, it's a relationship with Jesus. And he, he does that through the gospel. We come to Christ with this beautiful message of salvation by turning from our sins and turning to a new life in Christ. And now we enter into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. But more than that, we enter into a relationship where the Bible says we're placed into a body where we fellowship, all right? In other words, the proclamation of the gospel, just evangelism, that's not the ends, all right? That's not the end of it. That's not an end in itself. What it does when we receive the message, it creates a beautiful fellowship of believers, meaningful fellowship. Jesus and his disciples enjoyed a beautiful, meaningful fellowship as they walked with him those three years. And Jesus, as we said a while ago, was praying in John 17 for his disciples and the context is for all disciples to come, which is good to know even back then Jesus was praying for us, amen? That he said, and my prayer for us is that you, that we may all be one. So we're a fellowship. We're a fellowship with the Lord. We're a fellowship with the Father. We're in fellowship with the other apostles. I mean, when I'm reading scripture, I'm reading what had been given to us through the Holy Spirit through our brothers in Christ. My brother in Christ is Paul. My brother in Christ is Peter. These are my brothers, as well as you are my brothers and my sisters today. You know, our, our primary fellowship is first and foremost with our Heavenly Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as He works in my life. But it's also with every other believer on the planet. In fact, every other believer who's ever lived. Why? Because we're going to be with them. We're going to be in an eternal ship, fellowship. And this was the plan of God, if you read Scripture, was to bring us all into a fellowship. In Scripture, it tells us in 1 Corinthians that God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what a blessing when you think about the, the beauty of our salvation. I mean, I hear many people, even when they witness to other people, say, oh, this is not about religion, it's about relationship. But it goes even farther than that. It's about fellowship. That you now get to walk with God. You now get to know God. You now know Christ. You now fellowship in the, with and through and by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's why Paul speaks it of it in one place as a common faith in Titus. So the single truth here, you along with every other believer placed in the body of Christ is part of this beautiful fellowship. So in, think about this idea of fellowship. It pretty much in the, in the context thing is pretty much a specific Christian word. It really just parts to Christians because nowhere else is there any group like this on, on the planet who's been changed in their very nature, given gifts so they can relate to other people, minister to other people, encourage other people, and made one. In fact, when you come in here on Sunday morning, or when you're here on Wednesday night, or when you're in the Bible study somewhere, all our teaching and all our preaching really comes back to this, uh, is this idea of creating human fellowship and w enjoying that fellowship that's based upon our relationship to our divine fellowship, our relationship with God. We're in fellowship with God. I shared this morning with other campuses, you know, there's a popular saying, that people say, well, I'm in fellowship or I'm out of fellowship or that brother, you know, he's not in fellowship right now. Well, technically... Biblically, no Christian is at any time out of fellowship with God. You've been placed into him. You've, made, you've been made part of him. When, you, when two people get married, for example, there are times they might not speak to each other. All right? There may be times that partnership uh, is, is having some rough times, but they're still in fellowship. 
You may be in a partnership in a business. You may not be agreeing with your partner all the time, but there's still a partnership that's been established. Scriptures refer to a much deeper relationship that happens in our hearts and lives. Paul refers to the fellowship of the gospel. You know, and he said in Philippians 1, it continued from the first day of your salvation until the present. And he says, God's going to complete it all the way to the end. So a lot of times when we're blessed, you know, and, and we're walking in the spirit and our hearts are right. And so much we're, we're, someone says, fessed up. Then we think, I'm in fellowship. I'm in fellowship. How you doing? I'm in fellowship. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, what about the brother who says, oh, things aren't really right with God. I've, I'm not really being with God. I'm not in fellowship. Well, you're in fellowship. The problem is that, you know, that you're not enjoying the fellowship. Or you're not, bottom line, and this is where a lot of Christians are, you're not experiencing the joy of your fellowship. In 1 John, when Paul's writing that letter, 1 John, that our joy may be, he says that our, we have this fellowship, and he goes on to say, these things we write into you so that our joy may be made complete, or our joy may be full. You're in fellowship, you just don't have joy. You're in fellowship, but your joy is not being made complete. Ultimately, what is it that affects that? It, it's, it's sin, you know, it affects our, our fellowship with God. That, that's why it's important that as Christians, if we want to know the joy of our fellowship that he just talked about in 1 John 1 through 5 and 6 and 7, is that our heart gets right, we confess our sins and get back to our walk in fellowship, to joy, enjoying the fellowship and living in the fullness of the joy of our fellowship. In fact, I've discovered in my Christian life, and I discovered it early on, that a lot of my life is just ongoing confession <laughs> to maintain my salvation. Why? Because none of us are perfect. Don't tell that to your husband. None of us are perfect. Now, okay, you may be saved 100 years, you're still not going to reach perfection. And one day when you die and walk in the presence of God and glorification takes place, then perfection comes. But until then, you might as well be patient with yourself and you might as well be patient with each other because as, as James said, you, there's going to be times you stumble and there's going to be times you fall. But what are you doing about it is the issue. Am I, am I confessing it? Am I getting right with God immediately? Or am I holding on and being come proud and arrogant and bitter and rejecting? But scripturally, we entered the fellowship when we were saved. Now we just need to enjoy our fellowship by confessing the things that are not right in our life and, the, and our, when our heart's not right. Let me talk to you. That's the base of our fellowship, but the nature of our fellowship is unique. It's illustrated in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, when it all begins and the church is birthed. It goes on to say in Acts, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart, one soul, none of them. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but that all things were common property to them. That's an astounding, incredible, and important statement. These people realize uh, it's not about me anymore. It's not about what I get from this group. It's not about what this group can do for me. It's not about what you can offer me anymore. It goes on to say, there really wasn't even a needy person among them for all who were owners of lands and houses. Uh, they, they would sell and bring the proceeds to, of the sales, lay them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to anybody who had a need. In other words, people made their personal belongings available to people who had needs in the fellowship. This is a unique time. These early believers in Jerusalem had a mindset of just sharing everything. There's this element of true fellowship. It, it had a marked effect on those who watched them. I mean, the rest of the world was setting back in awe of what was happening. In fact, the result of their oneness and their fellowship, it goes on to say that a lot of people got saved. Many people were brought to Christ. Listen, all those who had believed were together and they had all things in common. Sold the property, possessions, sharing them with all. Anyone might have a need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, they broke bread from house to house. It says they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now that's the oneness that Jesus is talking about. There's a common, I don't think he's saying that everybody, when you join the church, bring all your titles, all right? And all your possession, but I do believe it means that what I do own really does belong to the Lord, and I'm available to use it however God instructs me. So if I see a need and I'm impressed to do something about it, I don't sit back and say, Well, somebody else, do it. I'm participating. This is the fellowship. 
And Paul describes it later among the churches. He says in, in Romans, in Macedonia and Asia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor saints that were, or, or, or were the saints in Jerusalem. He said these other churches in other parts of the world saw the needs of the saints in Jerusalem and they wanted to help. This is fellowship. It's, it comes with a desire that happens to, to help people, to share with people, to meet people's needs. And these early Christians, they enjoyed this kind of fellowship with their money, their food, their homes, their prayer, their love, their spiritual blessings and teaching. If you look at the life of Paul, here's a guy who's always moving if he's not in jail, always going out. And he, he himself dis- demonstrated on several occasions his need for fellowship. When he asked for certain people to be brought to him or to fellowship with other people, even times when people he had disagreements with before. But he, he, he writes to, in, in Corinthians, he says, but God who comforts the depressed has comforted us by the coming of Titus. What's he saying? Man, I was in, I was in a bad shape. I needed, some, I needed some fellowship. I needed some, some brother to come along and help me. And he said, then God comforted me by sending my brother Titus. He also made mention of Timothy in, in, in 2 Timothy 4. He said, make every effort, Timothy, to get here before winter. And if you follow the story, you could tell that he cherished this guy's fellowship. He cherished these guys' relationship. He cherished the ministry that, that they provided him. So how do you know, you know? Well, you know when there's Christian fellowship today because people are caring about. They come together. And this is the basis of what we're talking about with fellowship. It's when we come together. We can share the word of God. We can share our cares. We can, we, can, we can pray for one another. We can believe God for the power of God's spirit to work in each other's life. When there's true fellowship, we're caring. We're not judging. It's one of the things that we always have thought with our lift ministry. It's more than about academic Bible study. It's about fellowship. Yes, we want the academics of scripture and the Bible study. But more than that, it goes into a time of reaching out and taking an application of that word and seeing that it's applied to each other's hearts and lives as people minister to one another. Listen, if, if, you know, if, if you're not in a lift group and if you're not in one of these Bible study groups, you're going to miss this completely. And you're not going to know the joy that God can bring. Why? Because you're too busy living an isolated life. God didn't call you to live that kind of life. You know, and the people that hurt the most many times in our church, it's kind of like a, it's, it's like a self-induced hurt because they, they won't be involved with other people. You know, when, when you go see them in the hospital, they, they're mad because nobody called me. And nobody's busy because nobody misses you. Why? Because you're not apart. You know, so don't complain if you're not apart and nobody calls you. You know? Can I get an amen? I know it may be a little difficult. But the idea is here, hey, if we realize we're a fellowship, nobody after the service is texting another member and says, well, what would you think about doing so? You know? Did you, did you hear Brother Joe when he said 2 Timothy and on the screen it had 1 Timothy? You know, can you believe, and, and, and there's this cutting and this biting and this bickering that people get into an attitude with. And we ask people, how are you doing, brother? And then they go into this long negative tirade. Well, I don't get are that children. Are they? Hey, that's when you're, you, you don't step, oh, really? You say, brother, let's pray about that because if there's a need there, we're missing. We want to know what it is because we're, this is, this is the body of Christ. We're here for each other, you know? Well, I just think I couldn't stand there. Now, Brother Tim made that statement. That I said, well, let's go talk to Brother Tim and see what he meant. That's fellowship. That's caring about. That's what Christian fellowship. We don't bite. We don't devour. We don't provoke envy. We don't lie to each other. Scripture says we don't speak evil of each other. We don't grumble about one another. What happens? We start building up one another. Listen, if you're looking for the perfect church, you're not here. I mean, you ain't got there yet because there's no perfect people and people make up churches and we're all at different places in our spiritual growth. If you want everybody to be where you are, that'll get boring. Who are you going to minister to? And the worst thing you can do is be climbing up the spiritual ladder and look down and see a brother or sister down there who's not where you are and start judging them. Well, you know, if they were spiritual as I was, Lord help us. Maybe you're not so far up the ladder. Or say, pull up, get up here, be like me. Do, you know, you do like, talk like this, act like this, look like this. 
get over it. We, we, we develop at different places and different stages. Some have been saved longer, some have been saved less. Some have been saved longer with more teaching and more direction and more discipleship and more accountability than others have. And we're all at different stages. So that's why I said, you're wasting your time. He said, you, you'll eat each other up, is what the apostle said, if this is what your life is about. So what do we do? It's not about what I can find as a fault or as a negative, but how can I minister? How can I fill a gap? How can I overcome? How can I bring healing? What, I've been given gifts. What can I do? I forbear. I forgive. I serve. I practice hospitality. I, I move ungrudgingly towards other people. I admonish. I instruct. I submit. I comfort. These are all words from the New Testament about our fellowship. It, it is life touching life to bring growth, to bring blessing, and to bring joy of fellowship. Now, obviously, the nature of fellowship, it can be endangered by a lot of different things. As noted earlier, a believer's fellowship with God is never broken because it's an eternal relationship and eternal partnership, but because God is holy, sin destroys the joy of our fellowship. So if we sin willfully and continually rejecting what God's doing in our heart, we have personally broken trust with our heavenly father and have willingly, whether you want to see it this way or not, this is the black and white truth of it. We have willingly spurned the father's love. Don't need to say it again. <laughs> if we sin willfully and continually because God is holy, it destroys the fellowship we have with him and we break trust with our father. It doesn't change his love. Sin never changes God's love. And it doesn't mean the one who sins doesn't necessarily love God. They're just spurning the love of God in their life. It does mean that a sinning Christian can lose the joy of communion and the joy of fellowship, obviously. One of the things that we do is a symbol that the Lord has given to us in Scripture is the Lord's Supper. You know, when we share the Lord's Supper, it's a symbol of our fellowship. It's, it's, we call it a, a communion service because it's all about koinonia. When we gather here on, on a Sunday and we celebrate this time of, of, of worship and, and communion and fellowship, we call it the Lord's table. And we partake of the cup of the Lord's table and we partake of the bread of the Lord's table. These are symbolizing all that Jesus did for us when he died and the price that it costs so that we can, we can have fellowship with God and fellowship one another, all right? It's that saving blood and body of Jesus that is the basis of our fellowship. The word fellowship in the Greek language conveys a concept of fellowship and communion. Here's what the apostle writes. I mean, as, he's, as he's talking to, in 1 Corinthians 11, the church about when they're taking communion. He says, is not the cup a blessing which we bless, a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. What's he saying here? This table represents our fellowship. We shouldn't go out and fellowship with the devil. We shouldn't partake with them. We need to come to the Lord's table. He says, because of what it represents, our fellowship and the cost of our fellowship, he said, every man should examine themselves to see if they're really in the faith. And they should examine, he says what? They should examine the body. This is what he says in chapter eleven twenty eight. 28. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. If I'm not in right fellowship, if I'm not, if I'm not enjoying the joy of my fellowship, he says then, you know, you better examine yourself because if you don't, and you just choose to say, I'll take the Lord's Supper, I'll, I'll just reject the Lord's Supper, either one, I'm gonna stay in my sin. He says, hey, you're headed for trouble. And these people were taking the Lord's Supper without any thought for the way they were living their lives or the way they were treating the body of Christ. They were just there. If you look at the Corinthian church in that first chapter, he's reprimanded them for their selfishness, for their greediness, for their self-centeredness, for their arrogance and for their pride. He, they knew they had spiritual gifts, but they weren't interested in using their spiritual gift. They're just proud of their spiritual gift and what it meant for them. And so he's rebuked them. And he brings us back to this place of fellowship. This is about fellowship. Before he goes back into talking about the gifts again and, and talking about love in chapter 13. We are in fellowship. 
He said, and if you don't realize this and you choose to live willfully, rebelliously, and continue to against the Lord, he says, hey, well, he puts a warning on us. He says, some of you are sick because of this. Some of you are sick because of it. Some of you, uh, he says, uh, are dead. Some have died. We've talked about this before, how the Holy Spirit works in our life. You know, one of the most blessed things the Holy Spirit does for you is convict you of your sin. You know, uh, our pride doesn't like that, though. But that's, that's, that's a precious thing of God's love for us. That's a demonstration that he's a caring father. That he's not going to allow us to go along. So he, he brings conviction. Sometimes it's through another brother. Sometimes it's just in the quietness of your spirit when God just says you need to get right with God. And then it's kind of reinforced when you come to church and you hear some preacher like today. You're talking about sin and stuff. And, you, you know, it's, there's a tendency to repel that. That's the worst thing you can do. Embrace the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's a blessing from God because God's leading you to a deeper walk. God's calling you to a higher place. And God's calling you to more intimate communion and fellowship within the body of Christ. There's a better life to be enjoyed. So don't hold on to the old. Embrace conviction. What happens if we don't repent in our conviction? He's saying, well, the Lord may chasten you. Every child of God, because he's a loving father, whom the father loves, he also chastens. All right? There's a, there's a, there's a principle there. First is conviction. And the second is chasing. You say, what's next? Well, he even said it, it could get so bad in your rebellion as you choose to rather partake at the table of demons than to fellowship with God. He says, you know, it, it may cost you your life. Even John wrote, he said, there is a sin unto death. I don't think you ought to pray for it. <laughs> there's a sin unto death. It's just like God says in Hebrews, I will not allow you to trample underfoot the blood of my son, of the Lord Jesus. So there's that removal, conviction, chastening, condemnation of the flesh. Oh, you'll live in heaven. But the Bible says, as Paul wrote it, saved, but so is by fire. It's a hard way to live your life. When God has something much better for you, that all that sin issue has been paid for already, why live in it? Come to the table, come to the fellowship, come to the relationship of, of joy that God has for you in the fullness. Because sin definitely breaks the joy of your Christian fellowship, not only between you and the Lord, but with other believers. It's one thing to think of it, and most of us just think of it in this way, right? Me and God, but that's that narcissism I talked about. We need to think of it not only this way, but this way, that my sin not only just you know, affects me, but all the others that are in my fellowship are limited because I'm not being what God called me to be. It limits the use of my gifts, the power of the Holy Spirit working through my life. Nobody in the church, even though you may try to, you, you can't live as an island unto yourself. You just can't park yourself on, on pew, you know, three of row C or whatever. You realize that you're part of all your brothers and sisters in this room, and you look around and you see that those, these people are, are my family. We have been bonded together by the power of God's Spirit. We have a unique relationship and a unique fellowship. We are one in Christ, but not only we're there, we have a relationship that's important to one another. When you mess up, it hurts the whole body. When you choose sin, when you choose self, it hurts the whole body. It just as a, as, as a man in my family, as husband, father, if I choose to to say no to God in my life and rebel against what God wants to do in my life, it affects my wife, my children, my grandchildren, right on down the line. Why? Because you're not putting into or placing into the lives of the people he's connected you to the victory, the peace, the joy, and the love that God wants to place in their lives through your life. You've limited God. Same thing in the church. You've limited God. And so many people in the church, say, they're looking for ways out. Well, I'll do this, this, but I really don't want to get involved with other people's lives. I got enough problem of my own. Therein lies the problem. You do, but so do they. So we share in those problems. We bear those burdens together. We care for each other. And most importantly, we pray for one another. And if I choose to be self-absorbed and, and I let these things creep into my life, then it hinders and limits the power of God within the whole body of believers fellowship here. The danger to fellowship in any of our lives, there's a danger to our church as a whole when we let sin reside without repentance, without confession. The last thing I said, I want to talk to you about the responsibilities of fellowship. 
we'll just walk through these pretty quick. But there are responsibilities. The responsibility to maintain our fellowship by serving, by specific deeds for each other and other believers. In fact, those actions are referred to many times as one another's. We've talked about these, I believe, in past studies in our lift groups, what these one another's are and the importance of them and, and what they mean to us. It, let me just go over a few of them with you. In James, it tells us one of the first, as we look through here, uh, and I put them in this order because I think it's important. In James 5, it says, and it contains this command, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. One way to maintain fellowship within the body of Christ is to confess our sins to other Christians. Now, this is not to stand up before the whole church and say, hey, I'm committing adultery. All right, to tell everybody in the world what your sins are. This, I believe, is very clear when you follow the context. It's a personal relationship between you and another believer. All right, people of integrity, people of character, people who, you know, show them some maturity in their life that you can go and say, hey, I got a need in my life. I'm struggling in this area of my life. I'm hurting in this area. I mean, imagine the, the depth and the honesty and the beauty uh, and, and understanding that's brought into a Christian fellowship when believers can openly share their burdens and their needs and their sins with each other to say, I have a need here, you know? I, I, you, it, t I think too many of us are just too interested in making ourselves look good for each other. It's like we put ourselves in this little glass bubble and we want to shine brightly. You know, we, we walk into the church and all, all the way to church and before we left the house, you know, me and wife were at it just, you know, like two cats with their ties, tails tied together and thrown over a clothesline, you know, scratching and clawing the whole way to church. But as soon as we're on that holy ground of the parking lot, we park our little Bibles up under our arms and we walk in with this holy attitude. How you doing, brother? Oh, bless God. What this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, brother. What if you just walk to that brother and say, listen, man, maybe we can step over here and pray up. I'm, I'm, I have lost patience. I'm becoming angry. I'm short tempered. I've been acting that way to my, my spouse. Can you, just give me, you know, I, I, I need you to pray with me. Now, you might be surprised when you say that to your brother or a sister to a sister, when they respond like, oh, me too. <laughs> it's amazing the way the Lord can bring those people together. Amen? Me too. Let's go pray. But also with that, you know what comes? This beautiful thing that happens of, uh, of ministering one another comes this accountability to each other at the same time. You know? Uh, we don't have to walk around these little glass bubbles that we're always polishing to look like some kind of super saint. Now we have a freedom in our life. Nobody, we're having to make people think that we're, we're, you know, Mr. Incredible or Mrs. Incredible. I think sometimes Kathy gets a little upset with me because I like to confess everything for the pulpit a lot of times. <laughs> but there's no, there's no place for pretense here. Any preacher gets up and wants you to think he's the best thing since sliced bread, you know, you need a new pastor. You know, we all have failures. And just because a guy puts reverend in front of his name, hey, it don't mean nothing. All right? He's still a man. All right? You're still a person. You still battle the same thing that everybody else battles with. The same temptations. And what we best do is, do, James says, we confess these things to one another. Now, I don't think this is in public meetings because I've seen that destroy fellowships. But if one believer confessing to another and then praying for another. But I think another way that it's really it's, it is important here, I think it's when one believer, he's talking about our attitudes in James, you know, in James chapter 4 and 5 about how we can be selfish. I think it leads into that saying, hey, you've had a problem with brother A. You go talk to brother A. If you've had a problem with Sister Sue over here, you need to go talk to them and you need to straighten out your problem. But not to, that doesn't happen often enough because what you do many times is we go talk to another brother about that brother or another sister about that sister instead of going directly to that person and say, I had a problem, I need to get it straightened out. I mean, this is what Jesus preached in, isn't it? When he, when he's in the Lord's, in, in that beautiful Sermon on the Mount, he says, hey, if you come to the altar and you're presenting your, offer, your offering at the altar, and there the Lord reminds you that you have ought against a brother or your brother has something against you, just leave your offering there before the altar. Go take care of the thing and be reconciled to your brother and then present the offering. It's not worth burying around. Hey, I don't know about you. I get frustrated with folks sometimes, you know? If I get cross with you, you can be sure I'm going to track you down. And I don't like it when you get cross with me. I want to track it down. 
Well, I just don't like conflict. Good, neither do I. We can resolve it then. All right? And the head of my people, oh, I just don't like conflict. Well, good. That's not about conflicting. It's about restoring. It's about reconciling. It's about resolving. So you don't have to worry about the conflict, is you? Just be what God says. Confess your sin to one another. What's that result in? More purity of the fellowship of the people. More love of one another. More understanding of each other. More realizing the anxieties, the temptations and sins that we all face. And that we all need prayer in. Amen? But we have that responsibility. So what do we do? We confess our sins to one another. Come to that, obviously, forgive one another. There's a lot of times Christians have a real hard time forgiving other Christians. But you have to come to this place to realize the Bible says, as, you, as God forgave you, you forgive others. Well, they don't deserve it. No, they don't. I'll agree with you. But neither do you. What made you think you deserve forgiveness? Hello? <laughs> You know, if you think that you deserve forgiveness, you've got a much higher opinion of yourself than you ought to have. The Bible says, you know, we need to think carefully about what we think about ourselves. Don't let a man think more of himself than he ought to think. When a man thinks himself to be something, he is anything. <laughs> so, you know, don't get in that little, well, my sin, their sin, their sin, that's a big sin, that's a bad sin. There was a guy in the church in Corinth who was, you know, who knows that complicated, immoral crisis. It looked like he's sleeping with his mother or stepmother or whatever it was and you know and Paul says you get you need to deal with this guy's sin in chapter 2 obviously it seems this guy has repented they put him out of the church even for this immorality that was going on in his life and now when he comes back to the church and repents of his sin he says you need to receive that guy back into the fellowship you know you need to you need to accept him back in now you don't hold his sin over his head in fact he said in 2 Corinthians 2 sufficient for such a one is this punishment he was put out of the church, guys. He repented of his sin. Receive him back into the fellowship. And forget about it. You don't go back and hold it over people's heads. You do what? You receive them. You forgive them. Colossians, bear with one another. Forgive one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, you also should. How many are you ready for a moment of honesty? <laughs> Have you ever had a complaint against anyone? Have you ever had a complaint against anyone in this church? You can even raise your hands on the next one. Have you ever had a complaint against me? I have. You should. So what do we do? Yeah, bless God, I'm just going you know, to not forgive him. And every time he makes a mistake, I'm just going to tell everybody about it. Facebook, Twitter, here we come. That's why I don't do those stupid things. Too much temptation. If I'm going to tell on everybody, I'm writing a book. <laughs> so you and me better be straight unless you won't be in the book. No. None of us deserves to be forgiven, but we forgive one another anyway, right? Then he says, bear one another's burdens. Galatians says, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Burden bearing. What's that mean? It's sympathetically loving one another. And, but with it comes a responsibility to hold that person accountable. I'm holding this with you. I'm going to lift this up with you. I'm going to bear this with you. Sometimes it might be a struggle they're going through. It might even be a temptation. It might just be a life issue and a problem. But it means that you're going to say, hey, you know, I'm going to bear this with you. A guy came to me this morning, confessed something that was on his heart this morning. And I had a, I had an, a burden beyond just praying for him. I said, you know, for the next two weeks, I said, I'm going to put you on the top of my prayer list. I really, I, I really related. It touched my heart with what he said, you know. And I said, and on top of that, I says, I'm going to ask you about this each Sunday. Let me know where you're at and what God's doing. And I think we do that with each other on a much broader scale. I think it lets people know we really love them. We do this with our family members. We do this with our children and with each other, right? We should do it with the whole body of Christ. Not that we're trying to be the judge, jury, and rule over it. But we just care about people. And we want, to, we, we want to bear that burden. I mean, it happens. And it kind of follows the sequence we even talked about of a, a fellowship responsibilities. Of, of, of we confessing our sins. We're, we're forgiving each other. And we're carrying those burdens for each other. I mean, can you imagine, you know, in regard to this, what would just happen, you know, uh, if, if every church just did this? This point of accountability and bearing one of those burdens. The next thing you got ties right into is love one another. Now, this is with no favoritism. It's one of the most important themes throughout Paul's epistle, especially through Romans, when he's in 1 Corinthians, all of chapter 13. And why? Because it is the central thrust to our fellowship as a church. 
all right, and to any church. The fellowship is shattered when anybody in the church shows preference for another believer over another. We don't show signs of favoritism, and we don't esteem others, you know, uh, ourselves above other people. In fact, Peter wrote the church, and he said to them, listen, you should fervently love, fervently love one another. Go back to that. What's it mean? Fervently is, is a Greek word that's used in a medical context of stretching something out, perhaps over a wound for healing. Wrapping it, covering it, bring healing to minister to it. So if, we, if our love is fervent, that means that even when there is a need, a burden, a healing that needs to take place, we reach out to it. And we reach out and we stretch ourselves around it and we seek to be the one who rises up to meet the need. This sympathetic, hospitable loved one, submissive to one another, physically demonstrating of our care for one another. It, 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 it manifests itself with patience towards others. It manifests itself with forbearance to one another. It results in kindness to each other, tender heartedness, as the scripture says, ultimately forgiveness in all of it. He also says with the one another, so you encourage one another. Now he's writing to the Thessalonians in this passage when he says to them, comfort one another these words. And twice in Hebrews, we read the word that we encourage one another. In fact, it is a word for comfort. The word for comforter uh, comes from parakletos. This is the word parakletos, and it has to mean, it means that I am going to come alongside you to help you and to lift you up in this regard. He says you encourage one another. Now, in the context of the scripture, Paul's talking about how difficult it's going to be in the last days. Well, that's us, folks. That more and more increasingly, you're going to be rejected. Your moral standards are going to be, we're there now, aren't we? You know, with all this, you know, uh, LGBTQ stuff and all this transgender stuff and all this going on, the more that you formulate or express in a biblical opinion to the world, the more you're going to be rejected and the more you're going to be reviled. And it's going to increase so in days to come before the Lord's return, there's going to be more of a, a you know, vitriol kind of animosity that's going to be expressed ultimately in persecution as it is in many places already against the church. And he's saying, you need to stand with one another because things are going to get difficult. You need each other in this day. So you need to stand and come alongside each other and bear each other up and continue to remind one another Jesus is coming. That's the context of what he's saying, that you realize the day is at hand, therefore encourage one another with these words, lift each other up. And that brings us to the place not only encouraging, he uses the words in, about building up one another in Romans 14. And then he tells us the tool for building up, he said, that's the word of God. And Acts, it says, he says, Paul commends to the elders at the Ephesus church, he writes to them in the book of Acts, he says, to God, I commend the elders to God and to the word of his, whole, uh, to the word of his grace, which is able to to build you up. This is why it's important you know scripture. This is why it's important you memorize scripture. Not only for your benefit, and we've talked about the personal benefit of scripture memorization, but this gets into the benefit of somebody else around you that needs a word. And what a blessing it is when you're sensing somebody, you're not going with a preachy attitude because there's nothing more, you know, irritating than that, you know. Somebody wants to have a prepared sermon they come with. But when somebody comes with a heart of humility and says, hey, here's a word the Lord put on my heart for you. They're not doing it to show just how spiritual they really care. And they say to you some passage of scripture that, hey, I, I know you feel like giving up, but the Bible says that, you know, God is, he's committed himself to us, that he which began a good work in us is going to, he's going to bear it out all the way until Jesus comes. Until we see, so you're going to make it. You're going through a difficult time. You're having a difficulty, you know, but you're going to get through this and you need to know that God has committed himself. So what happens? If I'm personally ignorant of the Bible and I don't take time to memorize the word and put it in my spirit and my heart, then what use am I? I'm literally becoming damaging to the body of Christ because I'm not doing what I need to be doing to minister to other believers because that's what I've been called to build up. And he goes on to use it. Do you admonish one another in Romans 15? Now that kind of counsel and this word admonish, it kind of implies that something's wrong, especially in regard to sin. So it means that I'm going to my brother or sister in Christ and saying, hey, I know you're struggling with this in your life. But I want you to know it's important you confess that. And I'm here for you. And I'm here to encourage you. It's not harsh. It's not overbearing. It's not unloving. It's not abusive. It's not, it's not, it's not mean-spirited. You're just saying, hey, I love you. And I don't want to see you go down. You're going to have to deal with this. It's, it's an obvious thing in your life. It's going to hinder your walk, your fellowship, the joy of your fellowship, and your testimony. 
you admonish. Then he says, pray for one another. James 5, 16, again. That's, that's at the heart, isn't it, of our relationship to one to another. You know, how many of you get the, the prayer emails? If you don't, call the office this week. Put your email address in the box today and say, put me on the prayer list. I want to know when people have a need. I really believe that some, most of the people who get that prayer request, they'll stop for a moment when they read those requests and they pop up on their phone or whatever, and they'll say, a, they'll say a brief word of prayer for you. Sometimes they'll have more time, they'll take more time, and they'll pray for you. Some, a few, I don't believe it's most. We'll just, oh, okay, okay, I remember that. And don't pray in the moment. But I encourage you, if you're on that list, you're going to get needs that are represented. Some of them are critical. Some of them are emergencies. I mean, I mean we need prayer right now. And some of them are just for, I, I'm, I, I need prayer. Some of them are even unspoken at times. I just ask the church to be praying for me. I don't want to really state what's going on, but I'm struggling right now with something. But at the same time, don't be afraid to use that to make your request known. You know, get out of your little polished glass bubble. All right? You're the only one that thinks you're that spiritual. <laughs> all right? Most of us know we're just all people. Don't get that attitude either, that false humility, because it's really just pride in another mass. It says, well, I just don't think the church really needs to be concerned with my little world. Well, then you don't understand the fellowship. Amen? We are concerned. Or, you know, it's like they're so busy with their lives. You don't understand the fellowship. And that's the stupidest one I've heard. Well, you know, I just, you know, they're not like God's too busy to be bothered by your little problems. Do you think God feels that way about what you're dealing with in your life? Do you not think God's fully aware of what's going on with you? Do you not think he's probably already impressed other people to pray for you, even though they might not even know what they're praying about? You can be sure he is. That's the way God works. That's the way his Holy Spirit works. And that's the way the body is supposed to be excited about working. In summary, let me just wrap it up real quick like this. It says, you know, it's about fellowship. Christ came that your joy may be made full, it says. A joy that results from pure fellowship. With who? With one another. And it's, it's, it's possible. This is what God planned. This is what God wants for our church for you, for each other. So quit, quit glossing stuff over or quit isolating yourself or quit removing yourself. Quit looking for excuses to not be involved in the body and get involved. That's what this is all about. I can just see some people in heaven, you know, just kind of trying to find a place off by themselves. Yeah, nobody cares about me. Nobody really knows where I'm going and I don't want to burden anybody. Or they wouldn't understand. Or I've been hurt before. I don't want to minimize the fact you've been hurt. We've all been hurt. But you don't want to run from the source of healing either. And it's the body of Christ. You say, well, you know, I work real hard all week long. Well, that's all the more reason to be involved. You know, that's all the more reason. Well, you know, me and my, me and my husband or me and my little one person, we, we get together. That's good. You ought to do that. But you ought to do more than that, according to what Jesus is telling us, or why Jesus died, not so you can sit there in the Bible study with your spouse. So you can be involved in a life translating relationship with the whole body of Christ where you're having an impact, and they're impacting you as well. This is what matters. Who do we think we are? We're the body of Christ. Therefore, we have an obligation to each other to fulfill it. And that's our in-reach ministry. And that in-reach ministry is expected from every child of God. Every person in the fellowship is called to live by those simple biblical guidelines. It's using our gifts. It's serving one another. You're the minister. These are the matters. And it matters. Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed.